we're moving right along in the book of Matthew, getting into Matthew chapter 8 tonight. Of course, keep something there in Matthew 8, but if you would, turn back to Leviticus 13. So keep something in Matthew 8, because again, the rest of the chapter we're going through, but if you go back to Leviticus 13, and when you get to Levit Leviticus 13, you're going to want to keep something there too, because we'll be coming back to Leviticus a little bit later in the sermon. So just trying to keep you from having to you know, get a cramp in your fingers or anything like that. But as you're going to Leviticus 13, the Bible reads in Matthew 8, it says, when he was come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. And behold, there came a leper and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And Jesus put forth his hand and touched him, saying, I will, be thou clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus saith unto him, See thou tell, see thou tell no man, but go thy way, show thyself to the priests, and offer the gift that Moses commanded him for a testimony unto them. Now, it's significant here, uh, you see a lot of lepers getting healed uh, by Jesus throughout the Gospels, and I want to just talk about leprosy a little bit to begin with. Um, and if you, one of the first points we need to understand, well, let's just, let's just read from Leviticus 13 here, where we start to understand uh, what leprosy was and how God wanted to handle it, more importantly. It says there in Leviticus 13, beginning of verse 2, When a man shall have in the skin of his flesh a rising, a scab, a bright spot, and if... It, and if and it being the skin of his flesh like the plague of a leprosy, then he should be brought unto Aaron the priest, or unto one of his sons the priests. And the priest shall look in the plague in the skin of the flesh, and when the hair in the plague is turned white, and the plague is in sight, in sight be deeper than the skin of his flesh, it is a plague of leprosy, and the priest shall look on him and pronounce him unclean. So when a man had one of these boils, these risings, these scabs, these bright spots, when he was thought maybe he had leprosy, God commanded in the Old Testament that he would go show himself to Aaron or his sons, one of the priests, and then that man would look on it, and he was to look on it and use this passage here and to, to make a determination of whether or not what that man had was leprosy. And what the reason uh, it's important is because what we can learn from this is that leprosy is a picture of sin in the Old Testament. Leprosy is often a picture of sin. One of the, one of the, it doesn't just come out and flat out say it, that, hey, leprosy is a picture of sin. There's a lot of things that let the way lepers were treated, the way they were handled, the things that they were supposed to do if they had leprosy, that, that would be similar to what we would do with someone who was in sin. You see, first of all, leprosy is a plague, right? That's what it says there. It says, the uh, if, it, if, it, if it be in the skin of his flesh, like the plague of a leprosy. So leprosy was a plague. And if you know what a plague is, a plague is something that's very contagious. Like we think of the bubonic plague, you know, the black plague, where pe just people are just killed in scores by a disease that is just being spread and spread and spread. It's contagious. It's communicable. It spreads through contact, right? So that's one. That is a way. Sin is kind of the same way with us too. Sin is something that can spread. You know, the sins of other people are things that we can contract through, you know, fellowship. You know, if we hang around the wrong crowd. You know, we're going to catch their sin. Just like if a leper were left in the camp, you know, his, his leprosy would spread to other people in the congregation. So lepr leprosy is a, is a picture of sin in the sense that it's something that, you know, it'll rub off on us, so to speak. It's something that we can contract from somebody else. It's something that we can, uh, you know, end up partaking in if we're not careful. And that's why the Bible is real clear and, and, that we are, and commands us, in fact, to separate from those who are living sinful lives. You know, the Bible draws a real strong line in, in certain, with certain sins and says, hey, if someone is doing this, that, or the other thing, you have to separate from them. And it's not just because you want to, you know, make somebody feel bad or, you know, or put somebody down or, or make you try to make yourself look better or anything like that. But the reason for that is because if we let sin come in the camp, if we let that leprosy stay, what it'll do is it'll spread the rest of us. And, and that's something that we can pick up. So if you would, stay in Leviticus, but turn over to Ephesians chapter 5. We're going to see in Ephesians 5 and elsewhere, where the Bible is real clear that, you know, we should not allow sin within the camp. That we are not allow, that there are certain things that, that we should not uh, have fellowship just for the sake of our own, you know, our spiritual hygiene. You know, we wouldn't want to go out and catch leprosy. Uh, if, we had, if we brought in an actual physical leper today who had the literal disease of leprosy, I, you know, everyone would probably run to one corner of the room and scream, get him out! You know, they, they would want me and say, what are you doing, Brother Corbin? Get this, he's a leper, he can't be in here. He needs to go get that, you know, taken care of. You know, and, and praise the Lord, we're not living in a country where leprosy is still a problem. But there are parts of the world where leprosy can still be found to some degree. And back then, it was, you know, in, in, uh, in Moses' day, it was, a, it was a real serious problem. 
Now the Bible says there in Ephesians chapter 5, it says, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love, as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for an offering and sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. And he says in verse 3, But fornication and unclean, all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not once be named among you as become a saint. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this ye know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, no covetous man, who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. And he says in verse 7, he says this, Be ye not therefore partakers with them. See, there are people that we should be separating from in our life. What are the type of people? What well, it there? People who would be in fornication or any kind of uncleanness, right? The covetous, the, the, those that are involved in filthiness. These are things that we should be separating from. Now, if you would, turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. You see, in verse 7 of Ephesians, the key there in that verse, it says, be not partakers with them, right? Now, I do want to say this. You know, We're not trying to convert everyone to live an Amish lifestyle here where we just shun everybody that doesn't live like us. Right, but because life does demand that we be in the world, does it not? I mean, we have to go out in the world, and we have to, you know, work and live among the unsaved and, 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 and people who would, you know, might spiritually say if they're a leper, you know, that they they've got you know sin in their life, they're living, you know, the, with these certain sins that we're commanded not to have anything to do with. So I'm not saying that, of course, we should just try to avoid people at all costs, you know, and, and turn ourselves into the leper in a sense, and we'll go live out alone out of the camp, right? But it does, it does say, it does draw the line a little more strongly within the house of God. Amongst God's people is really where this line is very strongly defined of, of who is to be in the church and, and what does get you kicked out of the church. If you look there in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, it says in verse 9, I wrote unto you an epistle not to company with fornicators, yet altogether the fornicators of this world, or the covetous, or extortioners, or the idolaters, for then must he needs go out of the world. So that's what Paul's saying. You're saying, look, I wrote it to you not to company with fornicators. You know, we should keep the sin, we should keep the lepers out. We should not want, we don't want their sin rubbing off on us and affecting us and causing us to fall into those same same sins. And he says, I wrote unto you not to company with fornicators, and he says this, get out together with the fornicators of this world. He's saying, you know, I, I understand you're still gonna have to deal with people out in the marketplace. We're still gonna go out and reach the lost with the gospel. We're gonna talk to these people, we're gonna interact with them. <clears throat> he says, you then you must needs go out of the world. So it's not necessarily the people that are of this world that we're to, to draw this hard line or say, you know, we need to get the leper out of the camp. But it's, you know, I mean, even Jesus said, I pray not that thou should take them out of the world, but thou should keep them from the evil. So, I mean, we have to be in the world, but we should not be of the world, if that makes sense. So what we have to use is our, we have to use some discretion about when it comes to interacting with the unsafe, right? Because, of course, I don't want to, you know, the other... Uh, the other way to take what I'm saying is to say, well, then that means we can go fellowship with anybody that's unsaved, right? Then, then if that's okay, then we can just go do whatever we want. You know, we can go hang out at the bar. We can go, you know, do this, that, whatever, the, whatever it is, you know. We have to use discretion about rubbing elbows with the unsaved. Who it is that we're going to, I mean, we all probably have unsaved family members, you know, and I know a big deal. I've seen other Christians go through it, and it was, a, you know, when I wasn't living here, but back in Michigan, I had to deal a lot with, you know, family functions and things like that. And when you're, when you have certain standards that they don't have, you know, it can make some make for friction there. So you kind of have to use discretion about what it is you, you are and are not going to participate in. Where are you going to draw the line? And I'm not going to get up here and tell you, you know, you must not, you know, go to the the family Christmas. You must not spend Thanksgiving with relatives because of X, Y, and Z. You know, everyone kind of has to make that decision for themselves. But you definitely want to use discretion about it. And, uh, you know, and especially when kids are in the picture. When you have kids that are involved, you know, you kind of want to use some wisdom about what it is that they're going to be seeing at these functions. And maybe, maybe at sometimes it might even be an opportunity for them to kind of, a learning opportunity, if you will. They can kind of see, you know, what happens when Uncle so-and-so has <laughs> too much to drink at the wedding, you know, and, you know, or whatever it might be. But, you know, God forbid that we should ever, you know, hang around to the point where we feel okay with participating in those same sins. You know, if we're going to go to the family function where there's where there's alcohol being served, you know, I don't know necessarily that's the wisest thing, you know, especially if you have kids, but let's make sure our cup, you know, doesn't have anything in it. Let's get the clear cup full of ice water, you know, put, maybe put some lemon in it or something, I don't know, but 
there should never be any question that we are, you know, still going to hold the lines and of uh, the standards that we have for our lives, even when we're accompanying with with the unsaved. So we definitely want to use some discretion. And you know, if you kind of draw that line in the sand, you kind of express your feelings to your family. Sometimes a lot of families will accommodate that. I know one person where they would spend Thanksgiving with their with their relatives. You know, they would take their kids over there, and they all knew that he was a Christian, that he did not drink, that he did not approve of drinking. So they would have an early Thanksgiving in the afternoon. They would spend time together. They would play the, the white elephant game, whatever, exchange gifts. And then they would leave you know, in the early evening. And then after he left, that's when they all broke out their alcohol and had their, their fun. So you kind of have to use discretion there. I'm not saying that you know, we should go out and just be willing to participate in, in you know, any function with the unsaved just because of the fact that they're unsaved. You know, we have to use our own discretion there. But this command here to separate, as, as we would from, you know, you, what we're going to read about the lepers, that they were actually to be put out of the camp, that they were to be separate from God's people, that they weren't allowed to be part of it. Um, this, this gets drawn a lot more severely, uh, you know, in, when we're dealing with brethren, we're dealing with brothers and sisters in Christ, when we're dealing with the saved within the church. If you look there in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, look at verse 11, it says, But now I have written unto you not to keep company, if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner. So you say, look, these are the, if you know a brother, if there's a brother and sister in Christ that's within the church that is guilty of these sins, fornication, covetousness, you know, an idolater, a railer, a drunkard, these, that we are to not have to anything to do with them, that we are to separate company from them. It says right there, with no such one not to eat. You know, so not only is it just... Now, they're not to be in the church, you know, but they're to, to, we're to separate from them, from them within the church. But also, you know, we shouldn't, like, be hanging out with them outside of the church and, and, and going down to lunch. Why? Because, because it'll rub off on us. That kind of, that kind of uh, an attitude, that kind of a, uh, a sin can rub off on people. It goes on and says, What have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do you not judge them that are within? But them that are without, God judge it. Therefore, put away from yourselves, among yourselves, that wicked person. He says right there, if, this, if, if a brother does these things, that he's, he's a wicked person, and that he's to be put among, from among, out from among us. So we see that leprosy is like sin because it separates us from the camp. Are you there in Leviticus still? If you would turn back to Leviticus. So we see that when we have sin in the church, the person who's guilty of those sins is to be put out of the church. They're to be put out of the camp. So we can liken leprosy unto a sin because of the fact a leper also was to be put out of the camp. It says there in Leviticus chapter 13, look at verse 44, He is a leprous man. He is unclean. The priest shall pronounce him utterly unclean. His plague, shall, his plague is in his head. And the leper in whom the plague is, his clothes shall be rent and his head bare. And he shall put a covering upon his upper lip and shall cry, Unclean, unclean. All the days wherein the plague shall be in him, he shall be defiled, he is unclean. He shall dwell alone, without the camp shall his habitation be. So how is leprosy like a sin? Like sin? Well, in one way, it will get you separated from the camp. It is something that will get you put out from God's people. See, sin has a way of separating us. It has a way of separating us from God, right? I mean, especially when we're unsaved. You know, we are an enemy with God. You know, that we, that we, we're sinners. And uh, even after we get saved, you know, we'll always be saved once we get saved. We'll always be God's child. That'll never change. But we can still fall out of fellowship with God. Just like a parent and a child can have a bad relationship from time to time. You know, if the kid's acting up and not doing, doing right, you know, dad or mom's not going to be as, as you, know, uh, you know, not going to just throw open arms and, and say, hey, what, what, how can I bless you today, child? They're going to want to be stern with them and discipline them and, and uh, help them to get it right, get it right. So not only can sin separate us as leprosy would from God, but sin can also separate us from the local church, from fellowship within the local church. So another way that leprosy is like sin is the fact that it takes a priest to pronounce us unclean, right? And that's always the, that's always the dirty work that the, the preacher has to do, that the, 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 the pastor has to do. Or the, he's the one that has to get up and make the pronouncement, you know, so-and-so is unclean. And that's not a fun job. You know, I, I can't imagine the priest had a really good 
foot, that was a, 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 exactly a high point in their, in their, in their job. Hey, so and so's here, he's got a scab you need to look at, you know. That's not exactly the most glorious thing, you know. You know, I'd rather just get back to hanging out, you know, making sure the candles were lit and all that good stuff hanging out in the, in the tabernacle. But, you know, that was part of the job that he had to do. He had to get his hands dirty. He had to get around people that had, you know, a contagious disease, you know. And, and that's part of being a minister in Christ is that you have to sometimes look at people's lives, look at where they're at, and, and say, this is unclean, and you need to deal with this. Now, leprosy is like sin because it takes a, a priest to pronounce uh, to pronounce us unclean, but it also takes a priest to pronounce us clean as well. And of course, that was always the hope with, with the, the, the leper is that he would get that cleared up, that he would get well again, and then he could come back to the priest, and he could show himself to the priest, and he would say, hey, he's clean, and he'd be welcome, and he'd be restored back uh, into the camp. And if you would, go ahead and took, turn over to Le Leviticus chapter 14. The Bible says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, uh, Brother, but ye, brethren, be not weary in well doing. And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man, and have no company with him, that he might be ashamed. So again, the Bible here is showing us that there are people that we should not have company with. People that would, you know, not obey our word by this epistle. The things that Paul wrote, that they would say they're not going to obey these things. Well, it says that we should have no company with them. That why? That he may be ashamed. And there's certain things that if we allow them into our life, we should be ashamed of. You know, if we are in one of these sins, it should make us feel ashamed. And that's the point of putting somebody out of the church, is that they would be ashamed. Yet not count him as an enemy. Now, I'm not saying we should just bag on the guy, you know, put his picture up on a dartboard and, and just go to town, right? But he says we should not count him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. That's the whole point of putting somebody out of the church, is to admonish them as a brother. To say, hey... You've got this sin in your life, and you need to get it right and get it cleared up. That way you can come back and have fellowship. And, and you know, and, and a great practice is once that person gets that cleared up and they come back, to never mention it to them again. You know, that's, that's, that's the part that a lot of people forget. You know, and I've seen, I can tell you, that there, there's people of faithful word up in Phoenix that have been put out, they've been kicked out, even publicly even, you know, and still have gotten it right and come back. And praise God for that. You know, that's Amen. the whole point. That is, but that is the admonishment. The admonishment is not holding their hand and telling them they're okay and that it's all right that they're involved in this. No, the admonishment is kicking them out of the church. That's the admonishment. And, and admonishing them as a brother that they might get it right. Look at there, Leviticus chapter 14, verse 1. It says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, This shall be the law of the leper in the day of his cleansing. He shall be brought unto the priest, and the priest shall go forth out of the camp, and the priest shall look, and behold... If the, plague of less, if, if the plague of leprosy be healed in the leper. So, you know, there was always the hope that he would be healed and that he would, you know, uh, be allowed back in the camp. You know, and this is another picture of sin and the fact that, you know, leprosy what is, you know, in terms of salvation. You know, Christ is our high priest, right? It takes a priest come, has to go and say, this man is clean, and he has to go without the camp, right? And in terms of salvation, you know, Christ is our high priest, that pronounces us clean before God the Father. You know, He's the one that that uh, you know shed His blood for us that we might be cleansed from sin. You know, and in terms of restoring fellowship, you know, the re the church is to restore the fallen. If someone gets put out of the church for a sin that that's listed, and I'm not saying just every sin. Obviously, that it's very specific there in First Corinthians five what those sins are: you know, the fornicator, the covetous, the drunkard, the extortioner, the idolater. These are the people, right? And I, outside of that, you know, there's really nothing that you can say. You know, you, you gave me a dirty look. You know, so you can't get. You know, there, there, there's certain sins, but we should always want to bring them back into fellowship. So, in terms of restoring fellowship, you know, we can start to kind of see how the how uh, um, how leprosy is a picture of sin. Now, just kind of a side note here on Leviticus 13, and this is something that's always good to kind of remind one another of. You know, is that. This shows us just the practical principle of quarantine, of, of basic, you know, hygiene, you know. And this is something that we should all be mindful of as a church body, that if we're sick, we need to stay home. You know, we shouldn't, we shouldn't come, come to church and start, you know, <coughs> how you doing, brother, you know. <laughs> you know, sneeze and then go around shaking everyone's hand and, and, and get everybody sick. So that's just kind of a, a side thing. I don't want to go off on that. We've got quite a bit to go through here in Matthew 8, so we're going to move along, but... We're going to look at Matthew chapter 8. We're done in Leviticus, so you can go over to Matthew chapter 8 here. 
Matthew chapter 8, beginning in verse 5, the Bible reads Matthew 8, verse 5, And when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion beseeching him and saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home sick of the, of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus saith unto him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. For I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this man, Go, and he goeth, and to another, Come, and he cometh, and to my servant, Do this, and he doeth it. Now what's great about this story here, about the centurion, is that it shows us there, that there's really two elements that are needed in an, in an individual for salvation. He displays these two characteristics that I believe everybody needs to have if they're going to get saved. These are things that, that everyone must have. And what are those two things? Well, it's humility and faith. That's really what, that's the recipe for someone to get saved. If, if somebody is not, does not have humility, they cannot get saved. Yeah. And if they do not have faith, of course, they cannot get saved. Because salvation is by faith through grace. So, what shows us here, first of all, about the centurion, that he is a man that is familiar with authority, right? He was under authority, and he had subordinates under him, you know? So he was someone who understood, you know, how to be humble at times, and, and when to, to not, and to have, uh, you know, authority. He had authority, and he was responsible for leading others. And that takes a lot of humility to be able to be under somebody else's authority, to be to put yourself in that position. A lot of people bucket that, and they can't they can't handle that. They don't like that. I mean, we all have to do that to some degree. You know, whether it's to one another, you know, the Bible says you submit yourselves to one another within the church, you know, or to church leadership. That's another part of it. But ultimately, at the end of the day, we all have to humble ourselves under God. You know, He is the ultimate authority. You know, wives have to submit to husbands, according to the Bible, and, and the men have to be able to submit to, to God, you know, Christ Himself. So that's something, humility is something that, you know, affects us in all areas of life. But it's something that we see here that's necessary for somebody to get saved. And that's what this man had. He was a man in authority, but he understood that, you know, he could put himself, you know, uh, be, he could submit to Christ and by him telling, telling him to say, just say the word. And you don't need to come all the way to my house. So he was able to humble himself to the authority of Christ. He said, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof. See, a you know, lack of humility, you know, somebody being prideful, that's what's going to send a lot of people to hell, unfortunately. And if you would, go ahead and turn over to Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19. See, that's usually the one, that, that element right there is missing in a lot of people today. You know, and uh, we see this often in these well-to-do neighborhoods. You know, we've been spending a lot of time up in Phoenix knocking in the, the more well-to-do neighborhoods. Not even necessarily, you know, the upper class. Not even that. Just like, you know, middle class, upper middle class, those kinds of neighborhoods. You see a lot of pride there. And it's no coincidence that we don't see a lot of salvations in those homes. We don't see in those neighborhoods. We don't see the numbers like you would see out on the reservation where people are not as well to do. Um, <clears throat> which is why the Bible warns us about desiring to be rich. You know, the Bible says the rich man is wise in his own conceit. That's what the Bible says. The rich man is wise in his own conceit. He knows I've got all these riches. I'm the one that worked hard. I'm the one that was smart enough to figure out how to make all this money. Very conceited, he's very pride, proudful, or prideful, he's very lifted up and puffed up. The Bible says the rich man's wealth is his strong city. You know, he's not going to go to God for help. He's not going to go to God for, for uh, protection. You know, it's his wealth. That's what's going to shield him. And in a lot of ways, that's true. I mean, if you've got enough, enough money, you can get away with murder. O.J. <coughs> Simpson, right? I mean, you can get away with a lot if you have enough money. You can hire some, some you know, lawyers and, and, uh, and, and, and get away with it. The Bible says there in Matthew chapter 19, look at verse 23. And then Jesus said to his disciples, Verily I say unto you that a wretched man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. Again I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. So he said it twice. He says, look, let me illustrate to you how hard it is. It would be like trying to take a camel and put it through the eye of a needle. I mean, we would look at that and say, well, that is impossible. I mean, that's, that just cannot be done. Which is why the disciples, in verse 25, when they heard it, they were exceedingly amazed, saying, Who then can be saved? But Jesus uh, beheld them and said to them, With men it, this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. So you will still get people saved. Rich people can still get saved. It's not that God doesn't want them to get saved. It's just that they lack that one element that we all need, which is humility. If you would, uh, go ahead and turn over to 1 Timothy chapter 6. 
And the Bible warns us about desiring to be rich. Because being rich or desiring to be rich or it has a way of puffing us up and thinking that we don't need God. You know, we go out and knock these doors in these rich neighborhoods and I, I'm knocking, I'm expecting myself. You know, I thought of that sermon that Pastor Anderson preached down here. I thought, you know what? He's absolutely right. That's what this country needs. We need some judgment to come. Yeah. To shake some of these people. Yeah. To make them realize that they're not okay. That their wealth is not going to be their strong city. That they need to quit being so conceited. And that they need to understand and get humbled a little bit and see their need for a Savior. <laughs> the Bible says there in 1 Timothy chapter 6, well, the Bible says in Proverbs 23, I'll read to you, it says, Labor not to be rich. Cease from thine own wisdom. You know, we should not labor to be rich. That's what the Bible says right there. Labor not to be rich. I mean, by all means, labor. Go to work to feed your family, to take care, to provide for the things that you need to take care of in this world. But if we make our lives all about just acquiring riches, you know, we're really going to miss the point. We're really going to, we're going to end up hurting ourselves and others around us. It goes on and says, Well, thou set thine eyes upon that which is not, for riches certainly make themselves wings. They fly away as an eagle toward heaven. Isn't that true? I mean, it's so true. I mean, even those of us that aren't desiring to be rich, you know, we get that paycheck and it's like, by the end of the week, we open up our wallet and, and just the moth, you know, comes out. And I think of this verse where it says that they take, you know, they make themselves wings and they fly away. It's like you can't even tell where they really went sometimes. But the Bible says there in 1 Timothy chapter 6, it says, For we brought nothing into this world. Why should we not labor to be rich? Why should we not be so caught up in, in trying to get rich? For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. All these things, all these houses and cars and toys and vacations, and all of, everything that people are just got to have, all the materialism heaping upon themselves, and, and, and all the security financially that they're trying to get, when they die, it's not, you can't take it, any of it with you. And you're going to have to leave it all here. He goes on and says in verse 8, Having food and raiment, let us be there with content. And he goes on in verse 10, For the love of money is the root of all evil, which some coveted after. They have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. I mean, look at some of the most sorrowful, pathetic people that you would see in the world. And often they're rich. I and mean, you think about all the movie stars and the rock stars. And all the wealthy and the well-to-do people that have all, they, you think, oh, they have everything anybody could ever want. They're some of the most miserable people you'll ever meet. They've pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and what was that last one? Meekness. So that, there again, we need to have that humility. That's what the Bible's putting emphasis on. It's contentment, meekness, humility. He says in verse 17, Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded. So even if somebody were, let's say, they got saved and they had that wealth already to begin with, he's saying, look, that's fine, but just charge them to what? Be not high-minded. Meaning what? Conceited, proud, lifted up, puffed up in their own mind, right? So we see again the two elements that are present that are necessary for salvation are humility and what else? Faith. Which is why it says, there you go back to Matthew chapter 8, where he says... Uh, where, he, where he said, you know, speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. And Jesus turns around in verse 10 and says, When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said unto them that followed him, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. So this man, this centurion, is a great example of what it takes to get saved, of having faith and humility. Now it says he has great faith. I don't think we have to have great faith to get saved. You know, Jesus said he had the faith of the grain of a mustard seed, you could remove a mountain. So it's not necessarily how much faith you have, but it's where you're putting it. You know, if we're putting all the faith that we do have in Jesus, that's what counts. But this man, he had great faith. <clears throat> now the faith that the centurion uh, had, what, what, what was the faith that he had? Well, how does he say, well, man, this guy's got great faith. What did he do to cause Jesus to say that? Well, he simply believed in the word of God. That's all he did. In verse 8, he just, you know, he says he had great faith. And in verse 8, he says, speak the word only. That's what the centurion said to him. He said, speak the word only. That's all he needed to hear. It's just hear the word. And that was faith. And isn't that a picture of salvation? That somebody has to just hear the word only and believe the word that's spoken to them? So it takes, it takes a humility to completely trust another human being, doesn't it? To say, I'm going to trust in you completely to do it, whatever it is I need you to do. And when we're going to put our trust in Jesus Christ alone for salvation, that takes humility. To say, I'm not going to trust in anything that I'm going to do. I'm just going to put all my trust in Jesus. That takes humility. <clears throat> so 
So we're going to move on here for the sake of time, but if you would go ahead and jump down to uh, Matthew chapter 8. <coughs> Matthew chapter 8. The Bible says, And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and the west, and shall sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. <coughs> but the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of, cheek, gnashing of teeth. And Jesus said unto the centurion, Go thy way, as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. And his servant was healed the selfsame hour. So it's kind of interesting. He, Jesus kind of he uses this guy as an example of the fact that, you know, that it's not just, you know, just being a Jew isn't what's going to get you into heaven. And he says there, you know, that, that many shall come from the east and from the west. What is he saying? They're going to come from all nations. Just as that problem up to the promise that uh, Abraham was, you know, that in thee shall all nations of the earth be blessed. You know, it's not just one exclusive chosen race in the world that just, is just de facto God's people. He says right here that, you know, that the children of the kingdom, referring to the Jews, they're actually going to be cast out. That they're going to be replaced by those that believe in faith. And that, you see, the Jews, they lacked these elements that we were talking about, didn't they? They lacked humility. They cared more about the praise of men than, than, than of God. They didn't believe that Jesus was the Christ. They lacked the humility and they lacked the faith that is needed for salvation. And he goes on there in that verse and he makes it clear that the children of the kingdom would in fact not inherit the kingdom. So that's kind of a sobering reality. And you know, it's, it's, a, it's something that a lot of, uh, of Christians, frankly, seem to struggle with today. This idea that God would, you know, uh, wouldn't just save somebody because of the fact that they're, you know, they claim to be a, you know, a Jew. That's not what gets you into heaven. The, the, the fact is that it's always by faith. It has always been by faith. You know, Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. That's what made him a child of God. Amen. And isn't that who we're going to, that's who it says we're going to sit down with. We're going to sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I mean, the, 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 the progenitors of the children of Israel. That's who we're going to sit down with. While the physical descendants who reject Christ are actually going to be cast out. It makes it very clear, and Jesus says that in multiple places in the Scripture. I don't want to spend the whole whole uh, whole sermon on that because there's a lot here in Matthew chapter eight. But we'll go on here. It says in Matthew eight fourteen, and when Jesus was coming to Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother laid sick of a fever. So <clears throat> this is kind of whenever you got to kind of point this out is that. Peter is not the Pope, right? Has you ever heard that? You remember yeah. when we started the Catholic Church as well? Peter was the first Pope. Well, he wasn't a very good one, right? If he's supposed to set the example, you know, I don't know where they missed it, but the fact that he had a wife, you know. So if, so if Peter's the first Pope, what are all these other Popes doing, get, you know, without a wife? You know, they're, they're all living celibate, you know. Uh, they, they dress like, like, like women, but they won't, they won't marry one for some reason. I, I don't know. So Peter here, he's, you know, let me just make it perfectly clear that, you know, he was not the first pope. And it's for several reasons. One right here is the fact that he was married. It says right there he saw his wife's mother, you know, and that can either be a blessing or a cursing, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but uh, you always got to get the mother-in-law joke in where you can. I guess. But he was married, you know, he had a wife. So he's not a very good pope if that's, if that's what's required of popes. You know, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, kind of even try it to prove this point even further, that, that Peter was a married man. It says, uh, Paul speaking said, Have not we power to lead about a sister, a wife, as well as other apostles, and as of the brethren of the Lord, and Cephas. Now, who's Cephas? Well, that's Peter. And you get that from John chapter 1, where he, where he says, you know, Simon Peter, he calls him Cephas. <laughs> so then, what they'll say, you know, well, what about Matthew 16? That's the other big, Peter is the Pope passage, and if you would go over to Matthew chapter 16, because they'll say, well, you know, he might have that, whatever. They, I'm sure they've got some clever cute way to wiggle out of that one, the fact that it says that he had a wife, you know, in two different places in Scripture. But they'll go, well, what about Matthew 16, you know? He's the rock. He's the he, he's uh, who Jesus built the church on, right? Well, look at let's look at that. It says in Matthew chapter 16, look at verse 15. He saith unto them, Jesus speaking, he says, he saith unto them, but whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, 
but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So let's all see that. Aha, right there, he's the Pope. Because it says right there that he would found his he would build his church upon this rock. And he's talking about Peter. Well, there's a couple different ways to interpret this passage. Because that's one way, which I could be, believe is completely wrong. Uh, but you have interp another interpretation would be, you know, that Peter is a stone, right? And that Jesus is the rock. Because, you know, you ever heard of Pete Stone? No, oh, Pete is a very small stone. So he's saying, you know, you're a little stone, and I'm a rock. And upon this rock, I will build I don't necessarily go with that one. That's one I've heard thrown out there. So now I'm just going to throw it out there. And, and you know, it's not the, not the best one, I don't think. But what I think, what the rock that he's really, uh, you know, is he's either referring to himself is really what I think it is, that he's saying upon this rock, you know, Jesus is the rock that he would build his church upon. But he could also, another one that I've heard that I've kind of contemplated is that it was Peter's profession of faith that the rock is built, that is the rock that the church is built upon. Because remember, he asked me, he says, Whom say ye that I am? He said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. So that's Peter professing Christ. And of course, we know that's what makes up the church. That's what person gets, uh, gets a person saved when they believe on Christ. When they confess Jesus Christ as Lord, that's what gets you saved. And that's what the church is. It's, it's, the, it's the local assembly of, of believers, of those that have confessed Jesus Christ as their Savior. So that could, that's another way we could look at it and say, well, that's the rock that it, the church is built upon, is the confession of faith of, of Jesus Christ as Lord. So that's another way you could, you could, uh, you could look at it. But, you know, it, it, it's kind of ironic that they turn to Matthew 16, they're turning to Matthew 16 and trying to make this argument that Peter is the Pope because, um, because of what you read in verse 23. And this makes more sense as an appeal. To me, this makes more sense. I mean, when you read verse 23, you can kind of go, well, maybe Peter is the Pope because it says there in verse 23, and he turned and said to Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. Right? So he turns to Peter and calls him Satan. So maybe Peter is the Pope. I don't know. <laughs> That makes more sense to me because he's sitting there calling the Pope, you know, <laughs> Peter. So, so this is kind of an ironic chapter because you have first way of you know they're saying, well, Jesus is declaring him as the Pope, and then a few verses later calling him Satan. You know, that doesn't make a lot of sense, <laughs> but that's kind of what they they go with. So we'll go on and read in Matthew chapter eight, verse eighteen. Matthew chapter eight, verse eighteen. Now, when Jesus saw great multitudes about him, he gave commandment to depart unto the other side. And of course, we know the next following few verses is where he, there's the storm, and they're afraid that they're going to drown and go under. And they go, they find Jesus sleeping. I love that, but he's just taking it easy in the back. He's not worried about a thing. And they wake him up, and he rebukes them and says, Why, you know, where is your faith? You will give little faith, and rebukes the sea. And they're at the other side. It says there in verse 28, when he was coming to the other side, and in the country of the Gergesenes, that there met two possessed with devils coming out of the tombs exceeding fierce, so that no man might pass by that way. And behold, they cried out, saying, What have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God? Art thou come hither to torment us before the time? And there was a good way off from them, and heard of, swine, uh, of many swine feeding. So the devils besought him, saying, If thou cast us out, suffer us not to go away to, suffer us to go away to the herd of swine. And he said unto them, Go. And when they were come out, they went into the herd of swine, and, and behold, the whole herd of swine ran violently down a steep place into the sea, and perished in the waters. And they that kept them fled, and, and, and uh, yet they that kept them fled and went their ways into the city, and told everything that was befallen to the possessed of the devils. And behold, the whole city came out to meet Jesus. And when they saw him, they besought him that they would depart, that he would depart out of their coasts. Now, this is a crazy story. And this is, you know, there's a real good application here that's relevant to today's society. But what we see here is Jesus going way out of his way, you know, across a stormy lake to get one man saved, to go out and get this one, this, this demoniac saved, right? And when he gets there, the people that, and he casts them into the herd of swine, casts those demons in the herd of swine, and just destroys a whole herd of swine. You know, and that's, there's a lot of value in that. You know, if we were to go to like one of these farms around here, and just go out in the middle of, you know, some dairy farm and just start, you know, take a 12-gauge and start dropping the cows or whatever, some farmer's going to be upset. I mean, he's gonna, that's, a lot of, that's a lot of money. That's a lot of livelihood right there. I mean, Jesus basically just takes these people's livelihood and just throws it off a cliff. But why did he do that? To be a mean guy? No, because he was trying to get one guy. He said that it is more, it's worth more 
to me to see this one guy saved than this whole herd of swine. However much money, and I'm, I'm sure that was a quant, that was a large sum of money to those people. I mean, so much. It, obviously, it bothered them because they go into town. And they say, "Hey, you know, Jesus just cast all the swine into the ocean, and they're all, you know, well, what, what are we going to eat? You know, no more bacon. You know, I could kind of sympathize with them a little bit, just a little bit, though, right? No more bacon." So then they run back out there where they say, you know, oh, praise God, this guy's saved. This guy that's been in the tombs. You know, probably, a lot of them probably knew him. They probably grew up with him. They knew this guy personally. And they, were they happy about that? No, all they thought about were the swine. They were all upset that the swine were, were gone. And then they go so far as they, 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 uh, they go out and they besought him. They're begging Jesus to leave. Don't come here. I mean, what a missed opportunity. What a bunch of fools. I mean, Jesus could have, you know, he could have given them all kinds of things to eat. He could have fed them. He could have turned, you know, he could have cleft a rock right there in the middle of that field to cause water and honey to come out of it. He could have fed them with manna from heaven. He could have fed, he could have replaced that swine like that. But all they have is this narrow mind when they go out and they just say, get out of here. You know, you, you just cost us a bunch of money. And, you know, they don't even think about the fact of this miracle but this guy that, you know, if you read it else, elsewhere, he, you know, he can't even be bound with chains. You know, and he was living in the tombs, cutting himself. And uh, it's a sad story. They don't even care about that. But Jesus valued one, one, one person far more than an entire herd of swine. That's where he put his emphasis. And, you know, I kind of want to close on this point because it's something, I, you know, I've been wanting to get off my chest a little bit anyway. But it said, you know... I just want to say that it's wicked to care about people more than animals. You know, and it's ridiculous to even have to say that, but, you know, in the world we're living in today, I mean, I see bumper stickers all the time now, and I, and I talk to people while knocking doors and stuff, and it's just like, what in the world is wrong with you? You're just, you, you, people out there, they literally, there are people out there that literally care more about animals than they do human beings. That's where we're at. And, you know, it's something we ought to be careful about, because it's a trait that is associated with reprobates. I mean, if you go read Romans 1, it says uh, that they, they uh, changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like unto corruptible man into birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. So, you know, the reprobates, they, were, they thought so highly of animals that they even tried to bring God down to their level. You know, and so I'm not saying that everybody that, you know, considers their dog to be their child is a reprobate, but I'm just saying that they, they, they share a similar quality with them, you know, that, that that's something we got to look out for. <laughs> they just have to be one of these characteristics, you know, what would be the equivalence of these people, you know, the, and the Gergesenes where they, you know, what would be today's equivalent of, of the people beseeching Jesus to leave for the sake of the swine? Well, it'd be like PETA, right? The, uh, I don't even know, I don't even know what it stands for. People uh, for the ethical treatment of animals, that's it. You know, they're the ones that, you know, don't, don't eat anything that, you know, uh, you know, they just want animals to be treated well. They just they care more about how animals are being kept and things like that. And look, you know, the Bible is real clear that you know, uh, we, you know, it, it's a wicked thing to to be cruel to your beast. You know, the Bible says we shouldn't we shouldn't be cruel to our animals. I'm not I'm by no means am I, you know, condoning cruelty. But at the end of the day, somebody's animal that's their property, and they can do whatever they want with it. As far as I'm concerned, if they want to be a, a cruel individual, well then that's the reputation they'll get as being a cruel individual. But what I'm just trying to make the point is that we shouldn't let this philosophy of, of loving animals to the point where we're, we're, we'll put down human beings. Say, well, they're more valuable than humans. And you think it's not out there. It's out there. People yeah. think this way. You see these bumper stickers that say, dogs, because humans suck. You know, like, well, maybe you do. You know, like, maybe, you know, I know one that does anyway, and it's you. You know, because what kind of a sticker is that? I saw one that said dogs, and they had the greater than symbol kids. That's wicked. That's a wicked bumper sticker to say that your dog is greater than children. Obviously, you don't have any children. You know? And I pray you never do. Because I don't know. It's, it's pretty rough. Or people who call their dogs their babies. You know, I've known people like that. Oh, they're my babies. And I get it. You know, you want to talk sweet and everything like that. But at the end of the day, they're not babies. You know, you can't sit there and say they're anything equipped, even close. You know, you can see this philosophy of like a lot of millennials that are, that are getting married now. It's like, well, we're going to get a dog first. Let's see how that goes. You're not, you're not anywhere near Freddie. Mm -hmm. You think having a dog for a few years is getting ready to have a kid? 
I don't know, does the dog wake you up every night in the middle of the night for months on end? You know, hopefully you're not changing the diaper on a dog, you know, and then all the other things that go along with having a baby. I mean, I, it's just crazy that people are, are elevating animals to this, to this level. And you know what, I don't know who, who has what for pets around here, and hopefully, you know, if I step on any toes with this, you know, I'm sorry, but this is just something that needs to get said, is that another group that falls in this, in this group of people that are, you know, trying to, uh, you know, are placing more emphasis on an animal than a human are pit bull apologists. Okay, so I don't know who has what for pets around here, and if the steps on your toes, do bad. So <laughs> go to Exodus chapter 21. Exodus chapter 21. So I go to this website. I've heard about this website. I've seen it quoted, and uh, this is a, it's got a lot of real good information here. It's called DogBites.org. And you know these pit bull apologists. These, these are people. I don't. I don't understand how anybody can set up for this this breed of animal as well as a few others that are just responsible. As we're about to read here in closing, for just maulings and deaths and just fighting people and maiming people. It's horrible. And I'm sick and tired of having to get on Facebook and read story. It's like every month I have to see somebody share a post about some child who had their face bitten by a man-eating dog. Because people are just want to, you know, there was one I just read today or yesterday, and it was kind of timely with this sermon. This kid goes to an airport, and the emotional support pit bull bites this kid's face. And now that child is disfigured for the rest of their life because somebody had to have this breed that is known for being a biter. For being not just a biter, but a literal, a lethal animal that, that is bred, that was created to, it's a war, there's, there is such a thing called a war dog. Did you know that, like bull mastiffs? It's a war breed. They, it was bred for war. There's certain genetic lines within canines that are very vicious and very aggressive. So I'm just gonna. I know we've been here already. Uh, we're kind of past our time, but I want to go through this just because of the fact that you know you don't want to get up and say all oh, you know pit bulls are evil. That's close and pray. You know you, sometimes people need facts. They need to hear some facts to kind of because at first when I first heard this, I said you know I've known a couple pit bulls. They're not that bad. Well, no one goes to the pound and goes, give me the most vicious pit bull you have. You know, they no, no one go, goes looking for that dog. They all start out nice. Every dog starts out like a cute little puppy. That's how they all start that way. And even the pit bulls, they get big and they all do my baby, they never hurt anyone. Every dog that's ever, every pit bull that's probably ever bit somebody, the vast majority of them, I bet that's been said about them. Oh, he'd never hurt anybody. She'd never bite anybody until they did. So I want to go through these, I'm kind of going off on a rant here, but it says approximately 4.5 million dog bites occur each year in the United States. 4.5 million. Nearly one out of five bites comes infected. So if you get bit by a dog, you know, I'm a, this is kind of a sore subject for me because of the soul winning we do around here. You know, me and Brother Fabian were out tonight and it was just like, we went by that one fence. The fence was this high and there was like a ger two German Shepherds and then I don't, I don't know why. And the German Shepherd has like the front legs up over the fence. <laughs> just barking. Like I'm, I'm reaching for the, you know, my clock. I'm like, is this dog? And I was out with uh, Brother Hunter a few weeks back. We had, a, I mean, I had the video on my phone. We're walking by this concrete block and this dog is just barking incessantly, like viciously. I mean, big dog. And he's, and he's leaping the walls this high. And every and as we're walking by, you hear him running. You go, and that head will pop up. And, head will pop up. and he's running and jumping. And I I did the same thing. I thought it was funny. I got my video out. I recorded it. I'm like this is funny. This dog's like, Arr. good thing the wall's there. But sure enough, we go. So the guy comes out. We go. I, I hand him my invite. Tell him, give him my spiel. Yada yada yada. Well, we go. We go down. We come back past the house a few minutes later. The guy had left and left the gate open. Wow. And I walk by. And this dog just comes out and is like coming right at us down the sidewalk. And I've, not, I've had close calls with dogs. This is the closest I've ever had. I mean, I had to start, I had to turn around and start waving my Bible at it. I didn't know it was going to stop. Because I was always told, you know, if a dog charges you, you know, it's not like a bear. Don't curl up in a fetal position, right? You know, you're supposed to yell and make noise and, and not back down. That's because usually that scares them. And it worked. But as soon as I turn my back, I mean, it's right back at me. I was close. Like I, I was a little worried about that. We were both a little perturbed by that dog. So just pardon me while I go off on dogs for a minute here. The Bible says, or not the Bible, the report says there were 86 increase in dog bite related hospitalization between 1993 and 2008 in the United States. So in those few years, right, well like 15 years, 86% increase in dog bite. 
So there's like this culture that's kind of going around where people are having dogs more and more. And as crime rates go up and as this country becomes more ungodly and more wicked and more less you know, de-Christianized and people are more worried about their personal property, of course they're going to do the natural thing and go out and get dogs. They're going to go out and get animals that bark and bite and intimidate people. Well, as a result, people are going to get bit. So we see why these, these, are, these, uh, these rates are going up. Dog bites occur every 75 seconds in the United States. Someone's getting bit every 75 seconds in the United States. Each day, over 1,000 citizens need an emergency medical care to, re to treat these injuries. <laughs> Each day, that's 1,000 people. And it goes on and talks about how postal workers in L.A. are like the worst. They get it the worst. Dog attack victims suffer over one billion in monetary losses annually. You know, if you can't appeal to people's emotion, you can always appeal to their wallet. You know, hey, these dogs are costing a lot of money. Uh, then it goes on here in this whole thing in this article. If anyone wants the article, you can go and read it. You can go to the, the web page and look at it yourself. But it goes on. It says here, kind of gets on the pit bulls. It says our data revealed that pit bull breeds were more than two and a half times as likely as other breeds to bite in multiple anatomical locations. So you know you have the, I've been bit by like a dog off someone, like the little, the little ones that just kind of nip at your heel. No, no kind of, you know, just get you a little bite of the heel. It doesn't even break the skin. You're like, oh, you know, that's the kind of dog I'm gonna get. One you can just punt, you know, right across the room if you need it to. So, but you know, you turn around and that's it. They, they kind of, they kind of showed you who's boss. That you know, they could bite your toe if they wanted to, if you let them, you know. But it says this is saying here that pit bulls they will bite you multiple times in multiple anatomical locations. It's not like they just bite you and walk away. They bite you. They lock on. They thrash. They go for multiple places. They go for the throat, the arm. They, they are vicious breeds. Most alarming is the observation that when attacks come from unfamiliar dogs, the pit bull was responsible for 60% uh, of all injuries and ocular injuries. That means your eye. They, they, they get you in the eye. Uh, dog co dogs causing injury were overwhelmingly familiar with the patient. Did you hear that? Because that's, that's the big apology. Well, if they know you, they won't bite you, you know. Well, it says here that they were over overwhelmingly familiar with the patient. 53% of dogs belong to the family. That's tragic. And, you know, if you're, if you're one who has a pit bull and, it's, and, you're, and you and a spouse or whoever are living there and there's no children, okay, go ahead and take your chances. But if you have a child in the house, I mean, I don't know how you could ever live it down. I, and my wife had a pit bull when we, when we first started dating. And, you know, that was before I knew any of this, and thankfully I didn't have to put my foot down about that. She kind of got rid of him for other reasons, but, you know, it, it's not, I don't know how you could ever live that down. If, and that's happened. It happens where people lose, I'm not going to read the statistics, it's, it's very disheartening and saddening, but people lose infants to their dog, to their pit bull, you know, and uh, it's, it's, it's just not right. And it says uh, pit bulls are most commonly responsible. Attacks by pit bulls are associated with higher morbidity rates, higher hospital chain charges, and a higher risk of death, death than are attacks by other breeds of dogs. Uh, from 2005 to 2017, pit bulls killed 284 Americans, about one citizen every 16 days, versus Rottweilers, which kill dogs, kill every 105 days. So every 16 days, somebody got killed by a pit bull. Say, well, it was only 284. Well, you know what? It was just one demoniac. You know, it was just, it was, it's, it's just, just one demoniac, Gadara. Do we really have to waste all these swine for just this one guy? I mean, do we really have to make a big deal about all these pit bulls that don't? And what about the pit bulls that don't hurt people? I mean, it was only 284 people that had to die. From 2005 to 2017, pit bulls and Rottweilers contributed to 70%, 6% of the total recorded deaths. I'll just close with this one right here. It says, from 2005 to 2017, family dogs inflicted 54% of all fatal attacks. Over half of all the fatal attacks that occurred by dogs, it was, it was, well, it was dogs within the family. And it goes on that 64% of those attacks were perpetrated by pit bulls. Of, of the 284 fat bull, fatal pit bull attacks, fatal pit bull attacks, 50% involved killing a family member or household member. You know, and I can tell you a guy that I go to church with in Phoenix, and he had a pit bull, and he would have said the same thing. She'd never hurt anybody. 
and he had a pit bull, then he had this little annoying chihuahua that he still has, right? And uh, one day that, that pit bull just snapped and decided she was going to be the boss that she needed to do. let everybody know in that house who was, who was running the show. And she went right after that little dog and just picked it up, thrashed it. I don't know how that dog lived. And then uh, if I'm recalling the story correctly, you know, he, he got the dog, got her to let go of it, and then he, the dog instantly turned and went towards his infant son. Oh. It was like his toddler. He was probably like three or four. And lunged at him, something like that. But he knew that if he didn't do something right then and there, that this dog was going to go berserk on his family, on his child. So you know what he did? He, uh, what he did was, you know, he calmed the dog down and put it in a pen and just said, well, I'm sure it was just a one-time thing. No, he took that dog out of his backyard and yeah. put a bullet right in its head yeah. immediately. Called the cops and said, hey, I just discharged a weapon in, in, within city limits. And they came over and said, good job. You know, <laughs> save them the trouble. They love to shoot dogs, don't they? <laughs> but, uh, you know, he did the right thing. Are you in Exodus? I don't know if I had you turn there. Because here's the thing, you know, why read all that? Because nobody's, nobody in the room should be ignorant about the fact that pit bulls are a vicious breed. And once you become accountable for something, you know, you become accountable to the, you know, if you're accountable, uh, you become aware of what a pit bull is capable of, aren't you kind of accountable for what it does? I mean, that's a principle that's taught in Scripture. Look here at Exodus chapter 21, verse 28. If an ox gore a man or a woman, that they die. So this is an animal that belongs to somebody, goes out and gores somebody, you know, runs a horn through them, and they die. Then the ox shall surely be stoned, and his flesh shall not be eaten. But the owner of the ox shall not be quit. So the owner of the ox isn't going to suffer anything except the fact that the ox is going to be, you know, he's not going to be able to eat it. It's not going to be sold. It's just going to be killed and put away. So he's going to feel that, right? But if the ox were want to push in his horn, with his horn in time past, so if he's done it before, or they, there's been something about this ox where they say, this ox has the potential... It seems like it might be one who would like to gore somebody. It might be one that would actually, you know, go to that length and actually kill someone. You know, I remember I worked in a dairy farm in Michigan. My first day there, they said, you see the bull over there? And it was really easy to see because it was like that tall. So this big Holstein bull. They say, he likes to hit people. So whenever you're out in the field, you always keep your eye on him. And I've got a story about that that I don't have time to go into. But he was wont to do that, right? So they were warning me, you know, look out for this. And most bulls are that way. But he's saying, look, if, but if the ox were want to push in his horn in time past, and it hath been testified to his owner. If someone come and said, hey, you know what, these pit bulls are vicious. I mean, look at the stats. You know, let me tell you a story about these pit bulls I know. Let me let me show you this Facebook story. Let me show you all these dog bites, how they're responsible for deaths and the namings and everything that they do. And they, 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 they tell them about it, or they tell them, hey, your dog lunged at my child. Your dog came at my whatever, you know, tried to bite me. Your dog's vicious. Your dog got out of the yard and is, is killing other dogs. Your dog got out of the yard and was chasing kids on their bikes down the street. We saw that down the street here a couple nights ago. So when this kid's riding his bike, and there's some just wild, random dog chasing him. He had to chase the dog off. <laughs> he says, uh, But if the ox were want to push, and his horn in time pass, and hath been testified to his owner, and he hath not kept him in, but, he hath, but that he hath killed a man or woman, the ox shall be stoned, and his owner also shall be put to death. I mean, you're responsible. The Bible's saying here, you are deathly responsible for the behavior of your animal. If you have an vicious animal or an animal that can hurt or maim or even kill somebody, you know, it says right there, shall be put to death. If there be laid on him a sum of money, then he shall give a ransom for his life uh, whatsoever is laid upon him. So, you know, if the, per the, the victims, you know, the family says, hey, there's no sense in two people dying over this thing, but... You know, we're going to sue you in a sense, basically. You know, we'll let you live for X amount of dollars. You know, I don't know how you put a, a, a money, you know, value, a, a dollar amount on somebody's life, but, you know, that's kind of a, a mercy that they can show this this owner. Whether you have born a son or born a daughter, according to the judgment, it shall be done unto him. So you know, the Bible's real clear, you know, and hopefully that didn't make up the majority of the sermon. It was just me going up on pit bulls. But, you know, it's been on my chest, and it's something that we need to all kind of take heed to, you know. We're living in a, in a dangerous world. We're living with, where people are just kind of, <laughs> you know, they're just crazy and trying to think that they're like people in, in, in uh, the Gergesenes. They're more worried about the swine than they are the human being. They're more worried about their animals than they are about the lives that those animals can impact very negatively. 
So let's go ahead and close in a word of prayer.